I'm going to be talking to you about the MakerNet Alliance um, and um, ending up discussing an idea we've got for a visual ecology interface to help navigate um, open hardware designs. So um, I'll start off by giving you an introduction to the MakerNet Alliance, what it's about. I'm going to very briefly introduce um, three of our members, um, telling you about what they do. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the third one I'm going to talk about, Enable, um, and some of the challenges they've got in being able to find the right design among um, the many hundreds out there. And then talk about this um, idea we've got for a potential solution. And I'm going to be asking you some questions, and we'd love some feedback on, on the idea. Um, and I understand this mic is only going to the camera, so if anyone can't hear me at any point, just put up your hand if I'm not speaking loud enough, and I'll uh, try and remember to shout more. So the MakerNet Alliance is um, a grouping of people and organizations who are interested in working on local manufacturing um, all around the world. The idea being to decentralize manufacturing so that it happens much closer to the point of use. Now, we think about this in terms of three main areas. Um, the actual local production, um, which is factories, maker spaces, um, all kinds of, of you know, physical places and machines where the things get made. There's a global knowledge base, um, which includes things like business models, product designs, quality standards. And then there's digital infrastructure that can join the two. Um, and in terms of what we do, we think about all of these three elements. Um, but what I'm going to be talking to you about today is focusing on the the product designs element of the global knowledge and um, potential digital infrastructure that could help support that. The idea being, how do we get the global knowledge into the hands of the people who actually need it, um, who are making things in you know, small places all around the world? So some of the um, members we've got in, uh, in the MakerNet Alliance, um, it started out about two years ago. There were five organizations. Um, came together and did a, a as a consortium, um, did a project that was funded by the um, German equivalent of our Department for International Development to trial some ideas around local manufacturing in Kenya. Um, since then, we've um, broadened out and many other um, organizations and individuals as well have, have become members. I think we've got about 35 members now. Um, and they fall into all of those three sort of categories um, that I mentioned on the previous slide. So some of them are involved in the doing the, the manufacturing. Um, those are, they can be maker spaces like um, Fab Lab Winam, like Kamasi Hive. They can be um, private companies like um, Xena Technologies is the black logo in the bottom right corner, um, Clax 3D. Um, so those are the, some of the ones that are actually doing the, the manufacturing. Then there are um, some members who are focused on the, um, the global knowledge part. Um, so humanitarian makers um, that I'm going to talk a little bit more about in a moment is one of the organizations that helps to um, develop open source designs that can be used in other places. Um, a number of, of organizations are doing work in, um, for example, Tech for Trade, doing work around proving business models for local manufacturing in different, um, different contexts. And then we have some organizations that are more focused on the infrastructure that can link the knowledge to the actual manufacturing locations, such as Apropedia and Weevolver. Now, I'm going to um, give a, a brief intro to a few different members, just so you have uh, an idea of how this, this can work. And um, a lot of what I'm talk going to talk about refers to 3D printing. And a lot of our members at the moment are focused on 3D printing. That is not the be all and end all of this. Um, there are, I 
think there is, there is more happening at the moment um, in terms of distributed manufacturing in 3D printing um, it, because it's uh, so easy to, to share file information um, and because printers are so, so common now. But um, we are also doing some work on um, other types of, of hardware, but we're all talking about manufacturing of physical products. Now, Project Cogenzi is um, it's a project of Penn State University from the US. Um, it's a project that's based in Kenya, in a county called Kisumu, which is in the west of Kenya. And they embed um, 3D printers and um, engineers who know how to run them with biomedical engineers in the county healthcare system. So this is in the government-run system, the equivalent of the NHS. Um, the big teaching hospitals have their own maintenance departments um, and smaller hospitals may have small departments as well or, or may receive visits from sort of traveling technicians. Um, and they wanted to see, their focus is 3D printing, they wanted to see what use would 3D printing be in this context. Now, throughout much of the developing world, um, broken equipment is a really big problem, um, particularly in, in healthcare systems. There are, um, you know, equipment gets donated to places, so you may end up with um, a system that has a total mishmash of different types of, of devices, many of which are pretty old and no longer made. Um, and there just aren't the supply chains for the spare parts. Um, I was in Kenya earlier this year and I um, had the opportunity to meet with the head of maintenance from the um, district hospital that had been the main focus from this, this project and, and I could ask him what benefit this was to him, what he, use he saw of it. And what he said was that um, if, if they needed to repair something made of wood, he had carpenters in his team who could do it, okay? He had plumbers in his team who could had repair plumbing. If he needed something to be made of metal, he had fabricators down the road that he could call on. But if something broke that was made of plastic and it couldn't be replaced by a part made from a different material, then he, the only thing he could do was to try and track down an actual spare part for it. He had no way of making anything out of plastic. Now, the use case for him was speed, okay, Th which was even more important than cost. So when a piece of equipment goes down, you know, this hospital probably doesn't have, you know, multiple backup uh, sort of the equipment. They've got to get it back into use as quickly as possible. So um, from his perspective, the major benefit was he could get a, exactly what he needed made in a short period of time. Um, the fact that it was also often cheaper than the spare parts that could be bought was a bonus, but what was really important was that he could get it within a matter of a day or two instead of perhaps six weeks. Um, another member of, of the MakerNet Alliance, Humanitarian Makers. This is a, um, a global volunteer community of people who are interested in um, open hardware specifically for disaster response and also some development applications and who contribute um, to designing this hardware or um, also sometimes testing things that other people have made or you know contributing to documentation or you know reviewing other people's documentation to see if it's legible this kind of thing um, so I just wanted to mention them briefly in case anybody's interested in, in getting involved um, their URL is on the on the slide um, now I want to come on to um, Enable, which is, again, a global volunteer network. This one focused on um, upper limb prosthetics and on 3D printing. Um, humanitarian makers, um, in the previous example, is, is not purely 3D printing. I know they've been working on um, some electronic products um, and assembly instructions and some, um, some mechanical products um, as well. Um, but Enable focuses on um, 3D printable prosthetics. Um, it's been going for five years. It's been um, extremely successful. There is a network of several hundred chapters around the world, um, all of volunteers who um, tinker around with designs and also produce 
prosthetic limbs for people who need them. Um, and the, um, the community will also do a, a matching service that, that you know, people can sign up via the website to say, I'm in so, such and such a place and I need a limb and can, can match them with um, chapters that are as close as possible. Now, this, this has been enormously successful. Um, there are many people who contribute to the designs, who contribute to the testing of the designs, um, and who actually print them and give them to people who need them. And there are a lot of people out there who have limbs as a result of this. And it's a, it's a movement that's you know, growing all the time. Now, one of the challenges that has come up as a result of that success and that growth is being able to find the right design when you need it. Now, prosthetics are, every prosthetic is, is unique, pretty much, because um, people who have, um, have had amputations or, or whatever, um, born without a limb, you know, the, the socket is always different, the, the joint at which the prosthetic needs to start is different. I mean, Enable focuses on upper limb prosthetics, which are less risky. Um, although they're wanting to move into lower limb prosthetics in the future. But even if you just think about upper limbs, you know, that can be anything from a, you know, trying to replicate a shoulder joint and a full arm through to just a, a digit, um, a single figure, finger. And um, there are, there's been a huge proliferation of designs um, which do, you know, fantastic things, some of them, and some of them will be dead end. Some of them aren't particularly good. Um, it's, a, it's a volunteer network. Um, how do you test the quality of the designs? How do you even find the designs in the first place? I mean, they're not stored on a central repository, okay? They are, um, this is a, um, it's a decentralized volunteer community that doesn't want to be dictated to. They don't want you to say, you have to put it here and uh, tag it like this and, and um, you know, so that we can find it. Um, Three platforms that are used to a significant amount by the community are Thingiverse, um, Umagine, and, and Revolva. Um, but there are, you know, there are all kinds of other places. There are um, there are some designs for this on GitHub. There are, you know, whatever. So this this is the challenge um, that, to a um, to an extent, all these other applications of um, open source hardware for sort of development and humanitarian purposes in developing countries is going to come to, which is how do you find the right design that's got the right functionality for you, um, and how do you know that it's good quality? And I wanted to ask, um, among this community, is this a problem that you recognize, this, this fact that there is a, a proliferation of designs and you don't know how to find the best starting point to modify for whatever your purposes are. Can I just have a, a show of hands? Um, first of all, who has never come across this problem or doesn't believe it's a problem? Okay, I'm not sure if you're all asleep or what, but so, so the second question, you haven't come across this. Absolutely, yes, that's, that's very true. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. So, does anybody recognize this problem? Does anybody come across it? Can I have a show of hands? Okay, that's probably about half. Okay. Um, is anyone aware of solutions that already exist? You just mentioned one, which is <laughs> give up and make your own from scratch, okay? Which is one that's used quite often. What else could you do? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thanks. Any other thoughts on what, what solutions to this might exist? Yeah, the, uh, rather clever, the Facebook tag voting stroke rating system. 
Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yep. So, so that can help when you know which designs you're looking at and you've got them perhaps on a single platform. Um, I mean, and on one platform you often can get an idea of, you know, how many times has this been used, how many times has this been down downloaded. Um, but it doesn't necessarily help with the proliferation across different platforms. And the, and the platforms themselves are proliferating, okay? Anything else on this point? Absolutely. Yeah. You're absolutely right. A di design can be f for a very specific piece of equipment, and um, and in this particular, um, you know, example, the the prosthetics. I mean, you might have um, designs for a for a f just a hand, and designs for a full arm, and maybe that maybe there's a design for just a finger that's got a really innovative development in it, and you're looking for designs for an arm, and you don't necessarily think that you actually need to look at the, the finger bit and join it on to, to the other one. You know, how do you find out where the, the good, useful innovations for specific purposes are? Thank you very much. That's some, some really useful um, suggestions there. I'm going to um, move on and tell you about an idea that Enable have had. Um, which is to have what they call a visual ecology interface. Now, in the past, they have um, done this manually, okay? So, developing a, a tree that sort of shows what is derived from what else in terms of designs. Um, so, that it, you know, you have a, a f sort of forking parent type tree. Um, and you can also have things coming back together, obviously, when, when things are, are mixed together. Um, they have done this a couple of times in the past, a few years ago, when the um, community was smaller and the proliferation wasn't as great as it is now. Um, but to, be able to keep doing it manually is not um, practical. So one of the things that they're thinking about is, would it be possible to, to automate this with, you know, with the use of AI? And if you were doing it for prosthetics, then you could do it, for obviously, for other 3D designs. And so what I really want to ask you today is to what extent this could be useful for you. Um, just to talk a, a couple of, um, talk a bit about the ideas that we've had so far around it, um, this would not be a new um, platform for, for sharing designs. It would um, sit over the top and it would let designs be you know, stored and shared on whatever platforms that their designers wanted to use, which um, seems to be is something that's required by the community. People have preferences in what platform they use and they don't want to be told to use a certain one. So this would link to multiple ones. It would um, show the, the lineage of a design um, so you would be able to understand that Yes, this is a design that's just for a finger, but it was taken from this one that was a whole hand, or, you know, or whatever. Um, crucially, um, to your point, it would incorporate some visual diff tools. Um, now, we know that these exist already. Um, possibilities to compare um, CAD designs uh, visually. Um, they aren't widely used yet. Um, I believe that GitHub has developed one, but it's but not really done much with it. Um, I know that Wikifactory is working on one in their new um, platform, but that will only work within their platform. So the idea is that this would um, have a diff tool so that you could look at um, designs, you know, even if they're stored on different platforms, and it would visually show you what the differences are. Um, the idea is that it, this could, I mean, ultimately, it, it would make it easier to do something like this if you had the cooperation of the platforms where the files are stored. But you could get going with some, um, a mixture of some kind of manually, um, you know, pointing out where things are and some conventions like getting people to use hashtags like remixed from or something, at least to, to prove the concept and then use that to, to, to sort of demonstrate. 
Project Cogenzi that I mentioned just before, um, one of the things they're working on is the idea of, um, you know, could you develop a, a library of open source spare part designs, essentially, that are um, parametrized and can be, you know, adapted to, to what you need by users who don't have um, particularly advanced CAD skills. Um, and, yeah, it's... Um, it's something they're working on. I don't know as much about how it works in the context of, of prosthetics. Um, and, you know, I don't know, for example, if what you need for an adult is just a scaled up version of a child. I'm sure there are differences. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a great point. Thank you. Think about that in the context of, of Enable, the prosthetics community. Um, they, I mean, they already do the active role, okay? Um, you know, they already try and show people you know what is useful and this is a good way to do it and and so on um i think to a degree you're always going to end up with um you know with things that haven't um been done according to to those practices and guidelines and also the i mean this is a volunteer community you know there isn't funding for somebody to to spend you know their their working life doing this um, you know, the idea is, could a tool be developed that would do it this, um, you know, most of the way there? Thank you. I'm going to have to leave it there. Um, as I said, I'll be around um, later on to, to talk to you more. Um, the organisations that I've mentioned, uh, their URLs are up on the screen now. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>